This morning's panel will be moderated by Krista Anderson, who is a research fellow at the World Wildlife Fund. The plan is for Krista to start with a few questions for the panel, and then we will take some questions from the audience. We'll use a similar format as for the presentations. Please submit your questions for, via the Q&A function. I will now hand it over to Krista Anderson and the panel. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we've heard already today from Sally, Chris, Rob, and Paul, and we're joined by Jeremy now. Our objective in this workshop is to discuss research opportunities, and in particular today, of course, research opportunities around the global carbon cycle and natural climate solutions. Uh, Jeremy, as you're just joining us now, I'd love to turn the first question to you. Uh, given your role as a scientist um, in oil and gas, what do oil and gas company investments look like in natural climate solutions today, and what has your involvement been in this topic? Yeah, thank, thanks, Christian. Thanks for uh, allowing me to tee this one off. Um, I mean, go, going back to first principles, I think it's fair to say that society is pow powered by energy. And uh, Sally uh, very eloquently uh, explained the benefits of, uh, of, of energy uh, in helping to uh, societies to, to develop. Um, but of course, society is changing, the population is increasing, uh, emissions are, are increasing, and the, and the society needs to decrease its emissions. So I think as a world and uh, as, a, as a shell scientist, we are part of the, uh, the, the global community that uh, is trying to uh, tackle the climate change issue. As a world, we need more energy, but it has to, be, ha has to be cleaner. And there are a number of levers that you can play to uh, uh, decarbonize. And I think as a, as a society, we're going to, to pull uh, all those levers. Uh, I think you know, for Shell, it's about uh, the, the first lever we have is to, to uh, sell more natural gas, which has a, a lower carbon footprint, lower emissions than, than other energy sources. It's about uh, electrification. It's about generating more electricity, particularly from, uh, from wind and, uh, and solar. Uh, and it's about providing low, lower carbon fuels, so be they biofuels or, or hydrogen, or for people with electric cars, the ability to, to, to charge those cars. So that's a way of reducing the carbon emissions, but that's not going to be enough. We're going to need some other things. So we're going to need some uh, negative emissions technologies. Uh, briefly mentioned was, was carbon capture and, and storage. And the other one is, is what we call nature-based nature solutions, so uh, 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 natural carbon offsets. So Shell is in, in investing heavily uh, in uh, uh, projects to uh, decarbonize it in this way. And this allows us, for example, to uh, offer our customers uh, products, uh, be they uh, uh, be gasoline at the pump uh, in the Netherlands and, uh, and the UK, uh, or purchases of, of, of natural gas as a way of, de uh, of offsetting the carbon associated with that. So, you know, it's practical stuff that you can do here and now by investing in, 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 in uh, natural uh, nature-based solutions projects. Great, thanks. And could you just spend maybe one more minute talking a little bit about what some of those nature-based solutions projects have been for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this, this year and next year, uh, as a company, we're investing around uh, 200 million in, in, in these projects. And they cover the, uh, the whole spectrum. Naturally, in the early stages, this is a lot about uh, uh, reforestation or avoiding uh, deforestation. Uh, but we also uh, get it, uh, increasingly involved in, in other uh, natural e ecosystems that I think are, are also have, also have uh, great, great potential. So this is about providing products to our customers, but it's also providing the, the underpinning research and development uh, to understand the potential, uh, the pitfalls, the measurements uh, need, need, need to be involved. So that, that's, that's where Shell's investing at the moment. Great, thanks. And I think, Jeremy, given that you just, you'd mentioned carbon capture and storage, I wanted to turn back to an earlier comment where we heard about BEX. And I think maybe Sally, if you wanted to take a first cut at this one, what about the role of BEX in fulfilling our energy demand? And what are the research needs there? What is the potential? This is an option that has been sometimes contrasted with natural climate solutions in terms of cost and other opportunities. What would you say to, to uh, bring that into the conversation? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think BEX 
like like all the solutions, it can be part of a solution. And where you have ag waste and you have uh, forest residues, um, <clears throat> particularly associated with forest management uh, to keep keep healthy forests. I think that um, you know there's a, a important potential there. Of course, it creates negative emissions, which are are really useful. We've done um, detailed studies of the U.S. potential uh, and also uh, global potential. And in the U.S., um, by mid-century, uh, with a significant amount of effort devoted to um, to uh, actually dedicated forest crops, you might get between half and a million. Um, uh, Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that right. Uh, it, it could be on the sort of level of 10 to 10 to 20 percent of the U.S. energy supply. So it's not huge, but it's uh, it's not insignificant. Uh, in terms of research needs, um, there's a lot of, you know, devils in the details, you know, running power generation facilities with biofuels, which are pretty dirty feedstock. Um, you know, there are all kinds of inefficiencies. Uh, there are lots of issues with um, the efficiency of uh, residue collection. Uh, if you're going to be transporting these materials over long distances, you know, a lot of the benefits can be offset by, by um, those trans, um, the transportation. So, you know, doing really good uh, life cycle assessment is going to be really important. Um, I think that there's an interesting potential of DAC with BEX, uh, you know, sort of you get the double bang for the buck. Um, because uh, you know, uh, uh, direct air capture does need a significant amount of energy, and if you could provide that with with the biofuels and and sequester all those emissions, you could you know even get a bigger benefit. So so just to put that into finer contrast, if you're using natural gas to uh, to capture uh, CO2 as as your heat source, uh, for every million tons of CO2 that you're um, to putting uh, taking out of the atmosphere, you have another half a million tons of CO2 from the natural gas that you've used to uh, to uh, heat up the, the solvent to regenerate it. And so that's very significant. But if you're doing that with BEX, um, you know you get uh, you you know basically get two times as many emissions reductions uh, as you would if you took the alternative pathway. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's important. You know, I think that the uh, integrated assessment models um, have been extremely optimistic uh, in terms of the potential of BEX, but it's uh, it's still important, and and in certain locations could be extremely important. Thank you. And Chris, I see you have your microphone off mute. Did you want to add something to that? Uh, I, I was just turning my microphone off mute in order to. Uh, to be polite and, and ready to answer. Good, because I have a next question. <laughs> Zooming out a little bit as we talked about those research uh, opportunities, I would, I would love to ask you first and the other panelists as well, what, what might be your sort of top two research questions related to the global carbon cycle and natural climate solutions? So what, what research do you see really being needed to achieve this 100 to 200 billion tons that you cited as potential? You, you know, I. I think we've talked today mainly about the uh, technology and the economic incentives that might be most important. I think where the big unknowns are, are more in the political and the cultural and the social enablers and in uh, the kinds of incentives that actually work in real societies, questions of how things like uh, land tenure get addressed, how you deal with issues of protecting areas from deforestation where you have weak states and uh, incomplete governance. And <clears throat> I, I think it's easy to be too optimistic about the potential of natural climate solutions in places that don't have strong institutions and the biggest opportunities for figuring out how to make progress, I think, are more in the social sciences at this point than they are in the natural sciences. Now, others on the panel, would you care to offer your two thoughts? Rob, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I can weigh in briefly. I, I First of all, I agree with, with Chris in that the behavioral side of, of the ledger, um, you know, incentives, um, you know, decision-making really is a, 
is an important area that we haven't, uh, haven't, at least in our world, we focus on this technology side and the economics, but it isn't just about what's possible from a technology standpoint and what's possible economically. People have to decide to do these things. And so I think that's an important area. I'll leave, leave that as, as Chris said it. I think the other area that I think about a lot with uh, natural carbon solutions and, and especially negative solutions is scaling. You know, it's one thing to make something work on a project scale. You do it, you make money at the hectare scale or the tens or hundreds of hectares of scale. It's quite, quite different entirely to think about scaling something to the billion ton scale. And if it isn't the billion ton scale, it's really not worth talking about in this context at least. So I think um, we haven't talked about soils much. Uh, soils are a good example or tremendous benefits for restoring carbon into soil organic matter. We've lost billions of tons of, of, of soil organic carbon from soils due to plowing and, and other activities. So we could put some of that back, that would be a benefit for, for carbon, for water holding, for fertility. But if we take something like a, you know, a biochar application, it's one thing to do it on a project basis, one thing to do it perhaps on a farmer's field, another thing entirely to think about how we would do that across a national forest um, or on private land or all kinds of other things. So I, I really think about uh, about scaling quite a bit. Scaling to the billion ton scale is very different than making money at the project scale. Perhaps I can chip in on uh, some, some uh, going back to the science, some of the, uh, the R&D uh, challenges I, I see there. Um, I think in the short term, uh, it's around measurement, uh, particularly measurement of such uh, carbon flux measurements, but also biomass measurements, perhaps by uh, remote sensing earth, earth observation. These are all possible but they're quite expensive at the moment. Uh, so, so lower cost ways of, of, of uh, uh, quantifying uh, carbon uptake, I think is going to be really important. Next to that models, so development of, of, of robust, robust models that have uh, suitable and sufficient data input into them from these measurement techniques. So that's short, shorter term. Uh, lo longer term, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd really hope over the next couple of days, we're going to be able to think about uh, some fundamental questions whether we can actually store more carbon uh, than is uh, the perceived uh, carbon saturation limit of, of soils or whatever ecosystem it, it happens uh, to be, be that biochar or something else, and biochar was just mentioned, but there are many other potential uh, opportunities uh, there. Uh, and then really science-based, so looking out, uh, well, look, looking at real, in, into the real, real detail, to understand what those biophysical mechanisms are of uh, carbon cycling and other nutrient cycling, let's not forget the other nutrients, particularly nitrogen, in, in soils and ecosystems. So th th this is you know, down to the level of the uh, uh, plant root hair uh, to, the, to, to the fungi, the, the, the bacteria uh, in, in the soil. So those are, are, are real uh, R&D challenges. Maybe I'll, I'll add some <clears throat> thoughts in here. I mean, it seems to me that the key to making this work is to identify holistic solutions that are win, win, win. You know, they need to win for the people. You know, it has to be, you know, provide jobs. Uh, it needs to be win for the climate and it needs to be win for the ecosystem. And the time frame that we need to think about is a multi-generational time frame. You know, because, you know, this is, you know, these are century scale problems and anything that we do that's shorter time frame than multiple generations, you know, the land use will be likely converted back to, you know, some other thing that will release all the carbon. So I, I, th I think that's sort of an unusual sort of framing for R&D and even thinking about experiments, uh, you know, working with communities. And, and at the end of the day, it's got to make economic sense. And so I really think you need interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams of, you know, uh, ecosystem scientists, uh, economists, social scientists, um, economists, who could really figure out, you know, because it's often easy to start something, what's really hard is to sustain things, because at the end of the day, it's like, who's paying, you know, and, and, and the, 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 the sort of the burn rate to sustain, you know, infrastructure, and one could think about this as natural infrastructure, is very significant. And so projects that are framed potentially around particular solutions, you know, BECS being an example, um, you know, ecosystem restoration for um, 
for, for example, you know, restoring uh, watersheds that provide big benefits to water supply. Um, I, I think that, that those would be completely different kind of research programs, but something very valuable. Great, thank you. I'm actually building off of that, so both a time scale question and the sort of um, uh, question about effort needed. I wanted to ask one more, perhaps before we turn to the audience And this, I would start with perhaps Chris or Rob. I think that Rob had raised initially, at least this question about permanence and longevity for natural climate solutions. One of the challenges can be that uh, we're not, we don't, we don't know how long carbon can be stored or will be stored in terrestrial sink. How do we deal with this challenge and what are the still important research questions to resolve uh, around permanence? You want to start, Rob? Sure, I'll start briefly. Um, I want to make sure we bring Paul into to some of these discussions too. Um, so the, the solutions for land, most land-based land -based solutions are not permanent, um, but they are important in sort of a decade to a century time scale. Um, you know, eventually much of the carbon that we place back on land will, will return to the atmosphere. But even in, even in a sort of forestry management situation, there are things we can do to, do to lengthen that time frame. And I, I think it's the lengthening the, the time frame that's worth thinking about, as well as viewing the world as sort of a spreadsheet of where trees could be and aren't. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that kind of approach is, is a concern for me about permanence. Um, and a good example of this is, is China has the world's largest tree planting endeavor um, that's been going on for decades to sort of as a barrier between the Gobi Desert. And in some places, this has worked pretty well. In other places, it hasn't worked well at all. And it's a lot easier to plant trees than it is to grow trees. So I think concerns of permanence are front and center. And there's, uh, you know, I guess a, 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 a ton of carbon dioxide avoided as an emission is more reliable than a, than a ton of carbon dioxide planted. Um, but as we said before, we need everything. I, I might just provide three takes on this question of permanence. The first is that when we think about the long-term consequences of any natural climate solutions, there is potential for different outcomes at the project scale and at the global scale. At the global scale, the objective should be to have any intervention result in a long-term change in the mix of ecosystems with different carbon contents. And that's always going to be some that are abrading carbon and some that are losing. And it may be that on a particular project, uh, there's a trees grow really fast and stay for a long time, but that results in additional harvesting in a nearby area, a problem called leakage, and th that doesn't result in a net increase. And so we we probably have the potential and <laughs> this uh, the silo model kind of uh, highlights why there may be the potential to have a kind of a steady state carbon balance that's got more carbon in ecosystems than now by how much is, is uncertain. But there is the potential for shifting the uh, world from a, from a carbon depauperate state to a, to a somewhat more carbon rich state, recognizing that everywhere where ecosystems uh, experience uh, cycles of, of carbon uh, increases and carbon loss. Uh, a, a second theme that's really important that Rob highlighted a little when he talked about the new paper by Bill and Reg, great you're an author on, um, it, it is that many aspects of climate change are pushing us in the direction of decreasing the permanence of storage. And as we increase forces that lead to tree mortality, especially high temperatures, uh, extended droughts, risks of insect outbreak, not to mention the risks of, of increasing harvesting, we're, we're actually attacking the roots of our ability to increase the carbon in terrestrial ecosystems. And so there are lots of reasons to think that from increasing risks of wildfire to increasing risks of mortality from high temperature, that the prospects for storing large amounts of carbon in the in the terrestrial biosphere are are going away and the, the third point uh, that's worth keeping in mind is that in solving this problem we, uh, there's some benefits in in increasing the carbon stock in in ecosystems land and carbon in the ocean over decades to century even if it's not truly permanent 
humans are really creative. And uh, I, I think if we can make uh, what you could think of as a big down payment on removing carbon from the atmosphere, I'm not too uncomfortable with the risk that some generations down the road, um, our, our grandchildren or their grandchildren are gonna have to deal with the fact that that wasn't permanent. Great, thanks. And make sure we don't uh, miss out on the ocean perspective. Paul, you did a really nice job of highlighting um, the, the role of the oceans in the global carbon cycle and the potential harmful effects of monkeying with the biological cycle, uh, mm -hmm. as you noted. What do you see as um, sort of the, the, are there any uncertainties related to the future of the oceans in the global carbon cycle? And is there any interaction with natural climate solutions? Well, I think on one of the highlight. biggest uncertainties that I've had for many years is um, why is the ocean nitrogen limited? Uh, so terrestrial uh, ecosystems are hardly ever nitrogen limited. Um, you have natural terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, North American, actually virtually all lakes in the Northern Hemisphere are phosphorus limited. So the, the idea of nitrogen limitation in the ocean is almost certainly due to iron limitation of nitrogen fixers. And um, one way we could monkey with the ocean, which would not lead to the massive change in um, oxygen and um, gases on geologic timescales, or at least on timescales of centuries, would be to see if the ocean could be fertilized in the tropics to, uh, to uh, enhance nitrogen fixation. Now, I tried this uh, proposal several times to the Department of Energy and to, uh, to NSF. The experiment is on order of about $25 million, which to them was a choke point. But, you know, when I think about physicists that think about uh, machines that cost billions of dollars, $25 million should not be a big choke point for the conceptual understanding as to whether or not we could naturally change the carbon cycle uh, from the, uh, in the ocean by stimulating nitrogen fixation, which would be, I think, a relatively gentle way of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Now, I haven't done a cost-benefit analysis in terms of uh, how much that would be per ton, but that would be a relatively simple thing to do, depending on the amount of, uh, of iron that's needed and the amount of nitrogen fixation that it would, uh, would occur with it. So that's one area where you can monkey with the ecosystem in the ocean and probably not have a, a terribly bad effect, actually might be a beneficial effect. Um, one of the things that we see uh, in terms of what we don't have, I'm just gonna back up one second. We do not have a total earth system model that of the natural ecosystem that we can really rely on. And to Chris's point, for example, of social is issues, one of the major issues we see when we increase uh, food production around the world, in China, in the United States, in many parts of the world, is we dump huge amounts of nutrients into estuaries. And those nutrients are going into the ocean and they cause anoxia. And so, you know, this is a consequence of, of human population uh, and the way we uh, administer uh, nutrients to, uh, to agriculture. So this is a social issue. This is not just a, a technical issue. And, um, you know, we see this all over the world. We see this in the Gulf of Mexico. We see this in the, uh, in the Western China Sea, uh, in the sea between uh, Japan and China and Korea. Uh, we see it in the South China Sea. Um, we see it in, in the Baltic. We see it all over the world. So it's, it's one of these things where we need a much better integrated system in terms of science uh, and social aspects than we have now. So I would say those two aspects of things, one is technical, iron fertilization, the other is, a, is more of a, um, I guess, a computer model. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take away time now from some audience questions, so let me turn it over to any questions that we've received in the question and answer box for the panelists. Thank you, Krista. Um, so some of the questions asked by audience members have been touched on by the panel, but there's Shafiq has a number of questions that tie, to, tie these things together and drill down a little bit. So I'd like to go to Shafiq. Um, Shafiq, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your questions? 
Sure. I think um, Chris and Rob, I think you started to address this point uh, a little bit. I think this question of the rates, when you start pushing carbon onto the terrestrial ecosystem, for one, uh, you know, as you try tried to do it at the early stages, it's relatively easy to push carbon. But as you start to kind of build with time, that becomes more difficult. And potentially then you are just kicking the can down the road where you potentially have suddenly now all this carbon ready to degrade so that you can't stop, that you can't slow down. There was a paper maybe about eight, nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago in science on the amount of undecomposed carbon in the uh, Northern uh, forests, right? So uh, Siberian forests and things that if it kicks off with temperature. So are we potentially creating another major catastrophe down the road if we don't understand this kind of rate question well? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, the, the important thing to recognize is that with the full portfolio of things we're calling natural climate solutions, there's a, there's a biochemical, biophysical, biogeochemical link between the inputs and the outputs. And as you think about stuffing more and more carbon into whether it's trees or soils or roots or, or uh, any part of an ecosystem in the ocean, there's a, there's, um, a stability that's associated with that and, and a risk of later releases. And the, the thing that we haven't really touched on that's an important thing you need to remember about uh, these natural climate solutions is that you're essentially taking on the responsibility to steward them into the indefinite future. And that it's not just a question of, oh, I didn't cut down the tropical forest last year, so I'm done. That not uh, a deforestation uh, asset depends on not deforesting this year, next year, and every year into the future. And that's actually a significant burden that's associated with the long-term management of any of these. I agree. I agree with that. Maybe just a couple of, uh, of short follow-ups and we'll get to another question, but uh, it, it's, it's an, you know, it's an interesting point. And I think um, we do, you know, we do look at the examples that we have today for not just natural carbon solutions, but many other technologies too. But I think it's especially relevant for land-based solutions. And the, you know, the examples we have today start in the, in the best places. Um, and that's where, that's where projects should start. But as we, again, push the system, as, you're, as you suggested through the question, um, we push the system into needing to do these activities on lands that are less, uh, you know, less productive, more marginal. Um, and so I, uh, maybe to reiterate one of the points from my presentation, I really hope that we think about the other ecosystem interactions that will go along with that, that sort of, that wave of, of land-based activities into more marginal lands and such. I think we have the potential to store a lot of carbon and do good. I think we have the potential to, to cause some harm if we aren't careful. So I think that's one, um, one aspect that's important to me. And, and, and another, a second point about permanence, you know, it doesn't just apply to, to land-based solutions. It's also an aspect of CCS and, and, and carbon capture and storage underground. And, you know, California, I think the, the rule is that we have to, or project has to guarantee permanence underground for a century or more. And, and that guarantee over geologic time, it seems pretty natural. You know, natural gas stays underground for, for millions of years, for example. But that guarantee on a project basis of having to keep it there for, for decades to a century is a break on projects that might otherwise be developed. So I think this, this issue of permanence is, is a really important one. Thanks. Uh, and I, and, I think and if, I can, if I could oh. just build on that, perhaps, because uh, it, it, it's, t it's tempting to think in uh, any NBS project, uh, you, you, you initiate the project and then you walk away. And of course, there's, nothing could be further from, from the truth. Uh, keeping, the, keeping the carbon uh, locked up requires continued and sustained activity. So then the question becomes, how do you incentivize that? Uh, how do you get landowners, farmers, forestry owners, wh wh whoever it is, to, to uh, continue to, to, to manage the land and ensure the carbon remains uh, intact. So there have to be these incentives, and those have to be developed. Uh, they could be financial incentives, or they could be non-financial non uh, incentives, but they need to take place over years. And, and I, the second question I had that I felt we kind of have a little gap in the discussion was, 
this kind of interplay between the ocean and the land at the coastal ecosystems and there, you know, some of the ancillary benefits could be quite significant there to really drive, not specifically for NBS or NCS solutions, but the other benefits and it may make it much more economic to drive that. Are there any thoughts on that kind of how we think about this kind of inter interface between land and ocean and how to go after that? Yeah, perhaps I could say, say something about it. I, I, think, I think your point uh, about the, the interface between la la land and sea, oceans, is, is a specific point, but that there, is a, that there is a general one here as well uh, in that uh, when one is developing an NBS project, it's not just about the carbon uh, capture and the, the credits associated with that. Uh, it's really important that the project has other uh, wider uh, societal or environmental impacts. And in the case of, uh, of the literal, literal environment between, between oceans and, uh, and, uh, uh, and land, you know, uh, potentially around mangroves, for example, um, you could there think about uh, increasing productivity from the marine environment, shrimps, uh, fish, etc., as have been uh, seen in, in, in certain projects. So it is about other benefits in addition to the, uh, uh, the carbon storage benefit that's so important. You know, the land-ocean interface is, is really rich with co-benefits. It, it also is a relatively small area. And one of the challenges with all of these natural climate solutions is that they tend to result in low fluxes of carbon per unit area. And the big limiting factor on how much we can scale up coastal type solutions is just the limited area of the coasts. Back to you, Jenny. There's other questions from the audience. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. That, that was pretty comprehensive. So um, a little while ago, um, we touched on uh, some, an audience member touched on CCS. Um, and there was uh, also a discussion about the permanence and that there. So George, if you're still there, would you like to ask your question? And maybe the, the answers could also speak to the permanence of CCS. Yeah, so my question, I think, is really probably Sally. I don't know if it's really directed to, but really with regards to non natural carbon capture and sort of what is the best approach in terms of what modeling or research has been done. You know, more centralized capture, you know, geographically, you know, all of its capture is going on in the Arctic, you know, per se, versus a decentralized capture mechanism across the globe. In other words, when you, when you think about ultimately the the uh, capture, then you got to think about the transportation uh, and handling and logistics to be, to be able to sequestrate or actually use it for applications. Um, you know, that's when the uh, sort of the, the midstream uh, and the handling and the, and the transportation and all those things would certainly suggest different outcomes for cost and economics. Yeah, I, I, th that's actually a really great question. Um, I mean, in, in my opinion, to first order, you know, we should go after point sources that would otherwise be emitting in the atmosphere. So the location of those will be, you know, optimized for sites that are, you know, reasonably co-located with, uh, with geological storage resources. The broader question you asked, though, which I really like, is that, you know, if you decided, for example, to use direct air capture, um, and you wanted to optimize uh, where that's located, you'd want to find, you know, sinks for the CO2 that were going to be relatively easy to build the infrastructure, um, which will, of course, require um, energy infrastructure. You know, it's a very energy intensive activity. I think we saw a number that uh, 124. Um, uh, exajoules of power would be required to use direct air capture on, um, uh, I don't know, was it 10 million tons a year, um, uh, or 10 billion tons a year of CO2. So that's at the scale of a quarter of the global energy system today. Um, so the question then is, you know, do you want to do that in a very distributed way? Do you want to do that in a centralized way? I, I think it's a great optimization problem, and I, I think as a research idea, it's a really fantastic thing to pursue trying to come up with an answer to that question, what would be the optimal strategy? 
for massive uh, direct air capture or DAC plus BEX or something. I suspect it also depends what you want to use the CO2 for. So if, if, if you want to uh, put it down a geological structure, yes, you need to be close to the geological structure. Uh, but of course, if you're going to the expense of uh, direct air capture of CO2, uh, probably in the first instance, you'd be wanting to use that as a feedstock for other industrial processes, perhaps combining it with green hydrogen to make, to make chemicals, uh, rather than uh, simply making it inaccessible. Um, so there are all sorts of options uh, that are out there, and uh, yeah, you just need to, uh, to uh, compare one, one against uh, another. Yeah, but again, I think it goes back to your objective. If your objective is to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you know, you have to put it somewhere, just making a carbon neutral, you know, eventually having a carbon neutral cycle, you know, is what, you know, we, we're going to be needing, but on the pathway to recovering from, you know, the buildup of atmospheric CO2, we're going to need to be taking it out of the atmosphere and we either have to take it out and put it underground or we have to take it out and put it in ecosystems or put it in, you could put it in structural materials. We can imagine a world where we have massive amounts of carbon fiber that substitute for other structural materials. Um, but given the scale of carbon dioxide removal we need, uh, I think that, um, that, that I think that's unrealistic to think we can do that at, at such a massive scale in the time frame that we need to start doing this. I have a couple of additional questions. Um, I'd like to go to Ajay. Ajay, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jenny. Uh, it was a question to all the panelists that, uh, you know, when we take a look at all of the options available under the NCS umbrella uh, and uh, the breakdown that's there in the Griscom uh, paper, um, are there any particular ones that leap out for each one of you as either being particularly exciting or particularly challenging? Uh, because as, as Sally just pointed out that like, you know, when people talk about direct air capture, then there is uh, of course the, uh, the size of the energy input that is required. But in all of these uh, potential solutions, we're not talking about putting all the eggs in just one basket. Uh, it's kind of all of these different uh, potential opportunities have uh, you know, a, a role to play. So I'd be curious to hear about what what ones do you all see as particularly exciting and the ones that you consider to be extremely challenging? Want me to start? You know, uh, my sense is that each of them comes into particular focus and is the most exciting opportunity in a few places. One of the things, I, I think we almost have this tyranny of the of the gigaton uh, hanging over us and, and the idea that it's not worth looking at any technology or any approach unless we get a gigaton out of it. But I, I think we need to be more broad-minded about the way we're gonna stitch together contributions to solutions from a whole bunch of different components. And, you know, Griscom would all look at, at 20 potential pathways. I think they're actually more than that that can be utilized. And I think that in many ways, the both the opportunity and the challenge is figuring out where each of these opportunities comes into its own, where the co-benefits are really meaningful, uh, where the where the liabilities associated with it are, are, are manageable, and, um, and how to stitch things together. And uh, I wouldn't push any of the candidate solutions off the table as being irrelevant. If we go that direction, what we need to think about is how to provide a, an R&D and an accounting and a co-benefit accounting environment that, that allows each of those technology pathways to come to fruition at whatever scale it makes sense. Nice, thank you, Chris. Um, and I think Maybe I I, a thought, thought from, from me on that one. So yeah, I mean, Ajay, I, I, I think we are gonna need all those different uh, ecosystem solutions. But uh, there's, there's one that intrigues me and, and a molecule that's hardly been mentioned today. It's been mentioned once or twice, which is methane or methane. Um, I, I think there's some great, uh, some very exciting prospects around, uh, particularly around avoided uh, methane uh, emissions from things like peat bogs. Uh, and other uh, anoxic in, in environments, uh, including in, in in agriculture, for example, in in in, in rice in rice growth. I think 
uh, that that has uh, potential to be uh, to be very scalable, uh, but also potentially asks uh, uh, addresses the question about longevity against climate change, because when the climate does change, uh, uh, methane emissions will become uh, increasingly significant. Great. And if there's no further comments from the panel on that question, I think we have time for one more question um, from Brian Bartholomews. Would you like to unmute yourself when you're able and ask your question? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, we're introducing significant amounts of plastics and microplastics into the ocean. And uh, I'm directing this question at Paul. Are there or could there be any impacts of these on the cycles and the mechanisms that you previously described? I didn't see it in the, the macro maps that you put up. You don't really see the Pacific garbage patch or I didn't see it. But I was wondering if this is a man, it's a human introduced element into this into this sensitive ecosystem. And I was wondering if there's any, any comments or thoughts that you have regarding this. Yeah, Thank sure. You. So plastic is obviously a huge, huge problem in many parts of the world, not just the oceans, but in particular in the Pacific Ocean, um, <clears throat> Central North Pacific Ocean, the amount of plastic is huge. And ultimately it's converted down to nanoscale particles. And those nanoscale particles are assimilated into every organism. Um, they're, they're found obviously in fish, but amazingly to me, um, they're found in benthic organisms in the middle of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean, the Challenger Trench actually. Um, it's at 10,000 meters. So you, you, you have plastics that are sinking and they're found in food webs all over the ocean. The extent to which these affect the organisms, we don't know. Um, but um, certainly they are going to be something that are, is going to be a huge problem uh, for decades, if not centuries. And it's, it's really totally avoidable. We know how to make uh, biodegradable plastics that can be consumed and to CO2 ultimately. <laughs> by microbes, uh, but this is a huge problem, especially, um, it, I hate to say it, but many ships, the commercial ships, will just dump their, their garbage over the side. And that, you know, is unacceptable. Uh, when I go on a ship, for example, to the Antarctic, we have incinerators, we just burn the garbage, which is not great, but at least it's much better than dumping it over the side. And plastics are not allowed on the ship. So um, we, we can, that's another social issue uh, that can be, uh, can be remediated in very short period of time if, uh, if other countries especially were uh, cooperative. So I, I, as far as what, what the effects are, I don't think we know. We just know that we got the plastics too when we eat the fish. And um, it's, it's amazing to me to see this. Uh, we have a person who was studying plastic at Rutgers who worked in Mongolia of all places. And lakes in Mongolia are filled with plastics. So, I mean, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Doesn't matter whether you're a rich country or a poor country, um, plastics are everywhere because they're so cheap. 